All right, so now we're gonna focus in on inflammation and infection. Now before we get started, let's talk a little bit about some defense mechanisms. We have three lines of defense that protect our body against foreign invaders. Our first line of defense is our physical barriers. These are like our surface barriers, um, your skin, your mucous membranes, also sometimes um, the chemicals that are produced to make your skin more acidic, your sweat, your tears, your saliva. All those types of things are going to be the non-specific physical or surface barriers. These are things that we're all born with, so this is considered a type of innate immunity. We also see that inflammation is the next kind of step. Inflammation is again non-specific. When we talk about non-specific, it means it's going to fight all invaders the same way. It doesn't matter what the invader is, it's going to fight the same way. But inflammation is also an innate behavior or an innate type of defense in the sense that we are all born with the ability to undergo inflammation. Now inflammation is important in helping us fight infection and to heal. The problem is, is when inflammation becomes too severe or too long. And we'll talk a little more about inflammation in a minute. The last is the actual immune response, and this is a specific response. This is step three, and this was the one that we're not born with. It's the one that develops over time, and so we call this the adaptive immunity. All right, your immunity, when we talk about immune responses, are different than mine, because my adaptive immunity is different than yours based on what we've been exposed to. All right, so they're gonna be different based on that. Now this one does involve things like your lymphocytes, so like your T cells, and also your B cells, which make antibodies. All right, so that is this particular group. It's the adaptive immune response, meaning it's very specific. So guys, this takes that same kind of information and it puts it into a chart. It shows you the non-specific side, so they don't identify the enemy, and this is physical barriers like your skin. Um, your normal flora, which is the bacteria you have living in you and on you, and as long as it stays where it's supposed to, it actually helps you. And then also your mucous membranes. Mucous membranes are a mucus lining that lines any natural opening to your body. So if we put actual openings like into our ears and stuff, they don't continue to have a mucous membrane. It's only our natural openings. Inflammation is located here. It's gonna have neutrophils as part of this. These are some types of white blood cells and also monocytes known as macrophages when they become activated. So we do see inflammation does utilize some of the cells of our immune system, but this is still considered the innate or the non-specific type. On the specific side, we see that they're gonna identify who the enemy is. Then they're gonna determine what is the best response to that enemy. So this is gonna take a little bit longer in order to make a good defense against that enemy. This is gonna involve T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. Now T lymphocytes are the ones who kind of do the hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is like cell-to-cell -cell combat. On the other hand, B lymphocytes are going to use antibodies, which are kind of like missiles or arrows. They're gonna fight a little bit more from a distance. But both of these are gonna to work together in order for you to defeat the invader, but also to create memory cells so that your body remembers it for the future. We're gonna specifically focus in on inflammation and infection here. We'll talk a little bit about the more specific type of immune system in a later video, where we'll also look at what happens when those go wrong. But let's talk a little bit about inflammation here. Now, inflammation is a non-specific cellular and vascular reaction to the tissue. Now, guys, one thing to note about this is there has to be cells present. They have to be living cells. So cells are damaged in some way. When they are damaged, they're gonna release signals which are going to help trigger inflammation. The second thing here says it's a vascular reaction, which means there has to be a blood supply present. If there's not a blood supply present, inflammation cannot take place. Now, the point of inflammation happening is to help repel and destroy the invader, the potential invader. It's gonna also help clean up debris and help to promote healing. Now, remember I told you this does require a blood supply, and in a minute you're gonna see why. 
It's also designed to be beneficial. It's supposed to be a protective mechanism for our body, and it does this unless it becomes too intense or harmful. And this is what we can see happening in when our immune system kind of goes haywire with like hypersensitivities. So let's just say a bee sting does hurt, okay? It should cause a little inflammation, a little bit of pain, but for some people, a bee sting is deadly. It sends their body into anaphylactic shock, and that's an overreaction. That is where this inflammation and the immune system becomes too intense and thus harmful to the individual. So let's look at the process of inflammation a little closer. So first of all, we see that trauma comes into play. Some sort of trauma to the cells, cellular damage has occurred. This is going to trigger mast cells. Now, these tissues that are harmed and injured are gonna release chemicals that are gonna to talk to these mast cells. Mast cells are then gonna release the chemical histamine. Now, histamine, again, is going to be another kind of chemical signal, but it's also gonna cause a number of things to happen. So first, the histamine is gonna cause what we call hyperemia. Hyperemia is going to be where a redness comes into play because during hyperemia, we're gonna increase blood flow to the area. Blood is red, therefore the area becomes red. The area will also become hotter than the areas around because blood has a higher temperature than the rest of your body. Your average temperature is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Your blood likes to sit at about 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is where the heat comes into play. So we're increasing blood flow to the area due to histamine being released. This is also going to increase the chance for leukocytes to come in, white blood cells. Another thing histamine does is it brings more blood flow, but it's also going to kind of dilate the blood vessel in the area. This is going to cause the blood vessel to start to become a little more permeable, meaning that stuff's going to leak out, okay, because it's going to be stretched. The stuff that leaks out is known as exudate. Exudate is what causes a swelling or edema that's present. So guys, if you'll notice here, there's a couple of things underlined. These things are what we call cardinal signs of inflammation. If an area is inflamed, it's going to be red, it's going to be warm, and we're going to see some swelling or edema present. Now, this edema, because it starts to put pressure in the area, can cause some pain to take place. So pain's another sign of inflammation. And then also temporary loss of function. So if you think about your finger, if you had like a really bad hangnail and it gets inflamed, all right, we'll see that it's red, we'll see that it's hot, it's a little bit swollen, there's some pain there, but also you may not be able to use this finger like you normally would. And so there's a little bit of a loss of function. Now, this idea of also making the vessels more permeable is going to allow neutrophils to sneak into the area. This is known as diapodesis, where the neutrophils are going to kind of squeeze through the layers of the blood vessel, coming into the area so they can help neutralize the invader. Okay, so they're the type of white blood cell we're bringing in here. Now, the way that they get called to the area is called chemotaxis. Those chemicals released by the cells that were injured, as well as histamine, are going to draw in the neutrophils. Now, neutrophils are able to do what we call phagocytosis. Phagocytosis means cell eating. So the neutrophil is going to kind of like Pac-Man. It's going to eat up the invader. It's going to digest it. And in the process, it dies as well. Now, this creates pus. If pus is present in the area, this is actually telling you that your neutrophils and white blood cells are doing what they're supposed to do. They're trying to destroy the invader. They just may not have it completely neutralized. This is where monocytes come in. Monocytes, when they're activated, become macrophages. Macrophages are huge cells in comparison to other cells. They're like the tanks. It takes a while for them to get to the area of injury, but once they're there, they're going to help clean things up. They're going to help rebuild and start the whole process of helping with um, repair. They are really going to be able to do a lot once they get to the area. Now, if... We cannot neutralize the invader through these processes. This is when lymphocytes become involved. This is where the specific immunity, the specific immune system comes into play, and this is where they're going to then come up with a more strategic defense. Right? This is why it's a slower process, though, because they actually have to identify the invader, come up with a plan of defeating the invader, and then actually initiate it. And so because of this, it does take a little bit longer.
So guys, if we take a look here, this is just taking what we just talked about and putting it into another kind of flow chart with a few pictures. We can see that the tissue injury takes place and we have a cellular response and then we have a vascular response. In the cellular response, we see that neutrophils and monocytes become stimulated. The neutrophils are gonna sneak through the actual blood vessel into the area. Chemotaxis is gonna bring the neutrophils to the injured area. Phagocytosis then takes place. When they die, this creates pus, and the macrophages also come in to help take care of the invader and clean up the area. On the other hand, on the vascular response, we see vasodilation takes place. This increases, the, causes the redness and the heat in the area. This also allows the blood vessels to be more permeable, which means liquid is going to sneak out. That's the swelling. As the swelling or edema gets worse, pain takes place as well as loss of function. So again, you're seeing both of these. We have to have cells, but we also have to have blood vessels present. Again, if it's still not sticking, here's another way to look at it. It's showing you that tissue injury took place and it goes through a series of steps of what's happening. You also notice that redness, heat, pain, and swelling are all highlighted on here, showing you where they take place based on the different steps. So again, these are just some ways to help you potentially study and look at the different steps that are happening for inflammation. Now, when we talk about inflammation, there are some types. Acute inflammation is going to be one that lasts less than 10 days, all right? So it may last, you may feel like it lasts a while, but it's gonna be less than 10 days. Now, this is what we normally think of of just basic inflammation. You cut your finger, you have some inflammation, as it heals, it starts to go away. The problem is, is during a chronic inflammation, this is gonna last two weeks or longer, and this is where the acute inflammation was not successful in taking care of the invader. It was not able to actually completely destroy it. Now, it might have been able to wall off the invader, like keep it from spreading, but we still didn't take care of it and neutralize it. If this happens, it creates what we call granulomas, and granulomas are gonna be where macrophages have come in and walled off the area, and it protects the surrounding tissue, but we actually didn't destroy it and neutralize the invader, and this is what we see with tuberculosis. Other times we see chronic inflammation where we see the acute inflammation just keeps starting over, over and over and over again. These cells are not actually um, completely healed or there's still some damage taking place so they keep triggering this inflammation to keep going over and over again. You might see this with some types of arthritis. Um, we do see with chronic inflammation it could be an autoimmune disorder like rheumatoid arthritis that's taking place. One thing we want to look at too is called exudates. Exudates are going to be kind of the fluid, remember, that leaks out into the area where inflammation is taking place. And so a lot of times when we look at the exudate coming straight from the blood, it's going to have an appearance of a more like water fluid, okay? It's going to also help reveal whether we have acute inflammation if it does resemble more of the blood versus chronic inflammation. So if you have clear serum-like fluid, this is what we call serous exudate. Serous exudate happens during the acute phases of inflammation, and you find this in examples like skin blisters or cold sores, where they're filled with that, that clear liquid that's present. We can also have what we call fibrinous exudates. Fibrinous exudates indicate larger injuries have taken place. This means more severe inflammation has happened. Um, this means there's fibers present. That's where the fibrinous comes in. We see this in individuals who get strep throat. Also, bacterial pneumonia causes these mesh-like lesions to form inside of the lungs. Um, another thing that has fibrinous exudate is when you have a scab. That scab has fibers present. And as the healing takes place, it, they kind of pull together and get smaller and smaller until you no longer need that scab. We also have purulent exudate. This is known as pus. So this is telling you that the neutrophils and macrophages are trying to um, neutralize the invader. Now, when we have a collection of pus that's kind of been walled off into an area, we call this an abscess. All right, so an abscess is going to be a collection of pus that's kind of been walled off. We also have empyema. This is gonna be accumulation of pus that's in a body cavity. So we didn't wall it off in a specific area, but it's still contained in a body cavity. So like we might have it in the thoracic cavity walled off or the abdominal cavity, but this also means it's gonna be more widespread if it's inside of a cavity. 
All right, so this brings us to lesions. Guys, there's lots of different reasons that we might get lesions. Um, some lesions are going to be very characteristic of certain illnesses. Others are just going to be marks on the skin that are present, like freckles are a lesion. But freckles are not really a problem and so until they start to change shape or cause issues. And a lot of times those were moles to begin with and they change based on cancer. But when we're looking at the lesions that are part of the inflammatory response, these are due to physical or pathologic injury. So we do see with the inflammatory lesions, they include abscesses, ulcers, and cellulitis. So abscesses we talked about a little bit um, earlier where it's a walled off area of pus that's present. If it's a small abscess, it can take care of itself. It normally will drain on its own. Um, the body will reabsorb that and fix that. But if it's a larger abscess, we may need to go in and actually surgically remove the pus and the fluid that's present. And if the cavity is big enough, we may actually have to do wound care to heal up that area. Ulcers, on the other hand, a lot of times when we think of ulcers, there's kind of two types. We can talk about ulcers that are going to be issues of the stomach or intestines where we're eating away at the lining and that is a type of inflammatory lesion but also an ulcer might be a bed sore okay when we look at those bed sores that's due to pressure in an area where there's like a bony area as well this is going to cause a breakdown in the tissue and it can cause ulcers the last one here is cellulitis and cellulitis is where we start to see it this kind of abscessing type of purulent tissue not being walled off and it actually starts to move across an area and this can actually cause the person to become septic if we don't get this taken care of and we see that this purulent type of exudate starts migrating especially into the bloodstream it can cause sepsis to occur sometimes also when we talk about abscesses if they rupture improperly or we do see that they fuse onto another organ, we call these fistulas. And this is gonna be where the purulent tissue is kind of between two different organs and it's causing a connection to happen between them. So let's talk a little bit about tissue repair and healing because when we talk about inflammation, there's been some sort of damage present that the body's trying to fix. So this is an ongoing process and we do see that the process of repair and healing can be slowed down by a number of things. If you already have some other diseases or illnesses taking place, this could cause the healing process to be slowed down. Also malnutrition, if we're not getting enough of the nutritional needs in order for our cells to be able to reproduce and fix the area, that's a problem. And also if you have a compromised immune system, a compromised immune system means that this is going to be a slower process because those nutrients fills those macrophages as well as a specific immune system can't come in and do its job like it's supposed to now when we look at tissue repair we see that regeneration is going to be what we first see that we want to be done repair wise and if the tissue depending on the tissue that's injured if the tissue is able to do mitosis very easily let's say like your skin cells then it's going to regenerate it's going to lead back to a normal type of function that's present on the other hand a lot of times the tissue has a harder time um, healing and returning back to normal function and this is because it has to be filled with a fibrous connective tissue it did repair the area but this is known as a scar and when scars form it's going to be where they don't provide the normal function they did before okay and so this scar tissue does not do what the normal tissue has done before now a problem with a scar especially when we talk about in certain areas of the body let's say with like abdominal surgeries or openings in the abdominal cavity the scar tissue can start to actually adhere to other areas and we can call those ad adhesions a lot of times those have to be gone in and they're like bands of scar tissue and they need to be cut away okay to help restore as much function as possible to certain areas okay especially if they're attached Attaching, attaching to the intestines. It can cause major problems. Okay, Chewy, chill out. So let's just do a pictorial look at what regeneration looks like versus a scar formation. So regeneration, we see that it's not gonna be as deep and there's not gonna be this permanent injury to the tissues that are more of the connective tissues. And so the connective tissue is able to fill in relatively quickly. The epithelial tissue comes in and covers and we see that it goes back to the normal function. But if we have a deeper 
type of issue that happens, like the cut involves both the epidermis and the dermis, we see that there's going to be some scar tissue that forms. And you can see those fibroblasts or fibrin type of bands that are forming down in the dermis, the lower part of the skin. And of course, if we go deeper into the body, this is what happens. Sometimes the deeper the cut that takes place, also if the edges are very rough, okay, where they're not going to be able to come back into close contact with each other for a while, wound care is something that's going to need to be done here. So let's talk about how they can go through the process of healing. We have first what we call primary union or first intention, and this involves approximating edges of a wound. So if a wound is kind of like a surgical cut or a very clean cut where the edges can easily be brought together, this is gonna be what you see with primary union. A scab may form, but we also see that you could use like stitches or staples or even a type of skin glue to help close this off. After one to two days, new capillaries begin to bridge the gap between the wound edges. Fibroblasts grow across the deeper wound layers, forming these like granulation tissues, which are the new growth. And a scar does start to form some. And so even when we see a really deep cut from a surgery, you'll see that a scar does form, but it's going to be very small compared to if it was a gaping wound. Okay, and so this is what we see with primary union. Now, in a secondary union or known as secondary intention, this involves a larger, deeper wound. This is gonna be where there's more inflammation than what we saw with a primary union. It's going to be where the edges are rougher. They are actually could be debris and stuff inside of the wound that could cause issues with healing. And so because this is a larger surface area, more capillaries are gonna be needed, more fibroblasts, and more collagen fiber. So this scar is actually going to be a lot larger. Steps for secondary healing is we want to see that after a week, there's new soft kind of red bulbs of tissue that'll be at the base, the wound bed, the base of the wound, and this is called granulation tissue. Now, if you go into the medical field where you're going to have to do um, wound care, you need to learn what granulation tissue looks like because you want to make sure you don't remove it. Okay, and we can remove this by like, like scraping or even just like taking a gauze and wiping the area. It's very sensitive new tissue, so you have to pat in order to make sure that you don't damage this. Now, scar tissue layers will then start to be laid down as they form, but we want this to heal from the inside out. And so as it heals from the inside out, we might see that there may need to be a number of ways to help make sure that the top layers do not heal first. Depending on the size of this wound, the healing time will vary, but also skin grafts might be needed to close it off eventually, depending on the size. Now, what are some things that can delay wound healing? Okay, what are things that can really cause healing to halt in a sense? Well, it could be related to the dead amount of tissue or debris that's present. This could be the dead tissue, dirt, bacteria, leukocytes that have come in and died in the area or other contaminants. So we need to remove these contaminants. Could be a toxin that's being released. This is called debridement. When we look at debridement, we want to do this in order to speed up healing. And the whole process of debridement is to wash or cut out the necrotic tissue and the foreign material. Now, sometimes debridement is done right there in the ER or in where you're doing wound care and that sort of thing. Um, they may be picking out little areas that are the problem, but sometimes if it's a lot of debridement that needs to be done, it's gonna be done surgically. Now, when we talk about wound care, there's a number of ways that debridement can take place. They can do what we call a wet to dry type of dressing, and they'll take a type of gauze, they'll get it wet, and they'll pack the wound. When they come in to get the dressing changed then, then they'll pull it out, and that will pull out like kind of the dead necrotic tissue, um, any debris that might be in the area. There's other type of debridement techniques that we might use, where they might use a type of water. Okay, it's almost looks like a water gun, but they'll shoot water into the area and then suck up the tissue and toxins or whatever is present. We would maybe use that. It's kind of, kind of like a hydro type therapy. Other times they might use a suction, okay, where they'll hook up a machine that suctions out the purulent type of tissue while the wound is dressed. In even some cases, they might use maggots. Maggots are going to be able to go into a wound and they only eat necrotic tissue. They don't eat the good tissue, so they could actually help clean the wound out very efficiently. 
Now, some factors that affect wound healing include age. Really young people are going to heal quicker, or sorry, young people are going to heal quicker than older people. Okay, as we age, we have a harder time healing. The size of the wounds, smaller wounds are going to heal faster than larger wounds. The location, if epithelial tissue is going to be what's mostly hindered, it's going to heal very quickly. But if we see it's the deeper tissue like muscle or connective tissue, it's going to take longer for that healing to take place. Nutrition, we want to make sure you have proper nutrition. This may include increased protein and carb intake, even vitamin C. Immobility, um, heals faster if we leave the area kind of alone. We don't move it a lot. If you think about it and you have like a big, like even just a small cut on your hand, the more you move it, it opens it back up. So we want to make sure that it's in an area and we're keeping it from where it's opening up constantly. Um, but in the same sense, if a patient is immobile and it's like due to them having like bed sores or those ulcers we talked about due to them sitting or laying too long, that could actually hinder the healing process. All right. And so keeping something immobile during the healing process could be beneficial, but we also don't want pressure to be added into that area because that could increase problems. Also, circulation is super important. We need a good blood supply in order for healing to take place. Organism virulence is another um, if a microorganism is present and it's hard for us to get rid of it, it's going to slow down the healing time. All right, and some of these bacteria or microorganisms are going to be resistant to the medications that we use and we may need to come up with something else to try to remove them. Also steroids. Steroids inhibit inflammation, but inflammation is required for this process to take place. And so we see that it can actually decrease the healing process if more steroids are present. Now, what are some things that can complicate wound healing? Well, we see that poor excessive scar formation can occur. This could lead to wound dissonance where it's going to end up breaking apart, separation of the tissue margins. And this means we have to kind of start over. So we don't want that to occur where it breaks apart. Another could result in a keloid scar. This is where the scar tissue gets very large and thick and it can be very raised. All right, it's like an over exaggeration due to excessive collagen formation. Also, some adhesions can take place, and we talked about this earlier. When scar tissue forms and fibrous bands are going to form between tissues of adjacent organs, it can actually bind up and cause problems, okay, with the intestines or with whatever organ that is in, involved in this. And so because of that, those adhesions may need to be removed and those bands need to be cut. All right, so this leads us to the second part of this lecture. This is where we're going to really focus in on infection. Now, infection is an invasion of a microorganism. This microorganism will cause cell or tissue damage. Now, guys, microorganisms are going to be things from viruses and bacteria, which we normally think about when we talk about infection, but this can also include protists, fungus, um, even worms infections. And so this is not just bacteria and viruses. Now, normal flora is the normal bacteria that you have on your body. It's the normal stuff that you have on and in your body that help you on a day-to-day -day basis. The problem is, is sometimes these guys can become pathogenic. Now, a pathogenic microorganism is one that causes disease. And if it's one of your normal flora that's made you sick, it means it's become opportunistic. This is where the normal flora becomes pathogenic because certain conditions have happened. They've moved to an area they should not be in. They gained access into an area they shouldn't have. There could be something going on there that causes them to be opportunistic. But guys, a pathogenic bacteria, virus, or whatever is something that causes you to be sick. Now, conditions for microorganisms to become pathogenic include things like them gaining access to your body. They need a portal of entry. This could be through your respiratory system, your digestive system, a break in your skin. All right, so there's a lot of different ways they could gain access. We see that the pathogen has to also be able to resist your defense mechanisms, including like inflammation as well as your specific immunity in order to cause that illness or disease to occur. We also need a high number of invading microorganisms. If only one or two gain access, they're not gonna make you sick. You need more than just a couple in order to be able to cause the illness. Also, 
if you as the individual are in a more vulnerable condition, let's just say you already are sick with something or you're highly stressed or you're immune compromised, all those things could increase your risk and it could give the perfect kind of storm, the perfect conditions for that microorganism to invade and make you and cause disease. So guys, infectious diseases, these are the leading cause of death worldwide, okay? So most people, like when we talk about worldwide, a lot of people are dying from infectious diseases. Now it's crucial for us to be able to identify and track these infectious diseases. And this is what the Center of D Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC is supposed to do, as well as the WHO, the World Health Organization. They are supposed to provide these services to help us identify and track the diseases. Now, respiratory infections are actually the most common type that cause illnesses and sicknesses. And this kind of makes sense because they can easily spread from individual to individual. And this includes a lot of things like the common cold, also see with pneumonia, we see this with the flu, COVID, all that kind of stuff all falls into these respiratory infections. All right, so if we look at this, some of the leading causes of death in the world due to infections, majority of them, and it's actually about 80%, are due to respiratory infections. However, another type of infection by a microorganism is HIV, which advances into AIDS. Diarrheal diseases, these are a problem because they can cause severe dehydration. Tuberculosis, bacterial. Uh, malaria, which is a protist, it's carried by mosquitoes. Measles pertussis, which is also known as whooping cough, and tetanus. These are just some of the examples, but these are kind of the leading cause. So guys, some common infections that are caused by microorganisms in us as humans can be put into different groups. So we see here that we have bacteria and viruses. These are the two we normally think of. Some common bacterial infections include things like staphylococcus. A lot of times we call this staph for short. Streptococcus, known as strep for short. We also see E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Shigella, and Salmonella. Now guys, a lot of these at the end here are very similar in their, their issue when we talk about E. coli or Salmonella, Shigella. These are all going to be things that cause diarrheal type issues or what we consider food poisoning. Viruses on the other hand are smaller than bacteria and they're not actually considered living. These are things like the common cold, herpes simplex, simplex mononucleosis, this is what caused mono, HIV, measles, mumps, rubella, which is also known as the German measles or three-day three day measles, and influenza or the flu. Now some of these that you don't normally think about are things like fungus. This is like ringworm. Okay, it's caused by a tinea type of fungus. Athlete's foot is also part of this group. We also have the canididius. This one is gonna cause thrush or vaginitis based on its location. We have histoplasmosis, and we also have the, the coccidiomycoses. Okay, so these are examples of fungal infections. The rickettsia, the rickettsia is going to be a kind of precursor between bacteria and viruses. They're big. They're bigger than viruses, but they're smaller than bacteria. An example of this is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. We also have the protozoans. Protozoans are going to cause things like malaria and giardiasis. So malaria and giardiasis. And then we have the helminths, which are worms. These are gonna be roundworms, flatworms, pinworms, and tapeworms. Now pinworms and tapeworms are technically types of uh, flatworms or roundworms, uh, but there are different. there are a lot of different types. So let's look at each of these in a little more detail. So bacteria, guys, can be a primary or secondary type of disease. Um, the most common ones we normally hear about are staphylococcus. This is a bacteria that's on your skin but can cause opportunistic infections. And streptococcus, which is the bacteria that lives on your skin and in your throat. Some common enteric bacteria, the ones that are in your intestines, um, if they get out of there and they get into other areas, they can make you very sick. This is things like E. coli, Klebsiella, the Pseudomonas, the Shigella, and the Salmonella. All right, and guys, bacteria is one of those things that we can actually culture. This is why a lot of times they'll take like a sample. They'll take like a throat culture or a culture of your wound or something like that. They can grow it on a plate and they can figure out what type of bacteria is present. This helps us determine what type of treatment or antibiotic 
antibiotic we should give the individual. Because antibiotics are how we treat bacterial infections, okay? We also see that we have viruses. Viruses are the smallest infective organisms that we have. Must be visualized with an electron microscope. Guys, this is not even a microscope that we would use in our own labs around here. Um, there are electron microscopes at bigger universities and things like that, but we don't have these. So these are super, super small. We can't even see them on just a normal microscope. These guys are unique because they cannot reproduce or live outside of a cell. So they have to gain access into your cells in order to go through the process of making more viruses. Now, these are not easily treated or killed by antibiotics, okay? But if you have a viral infection, sometimes antibiotics are prescribed, and that's to help prevent or treat a secondary infection you get. And normally, those are bacterial infections that are the secondary Okay, so this is like if you've gone to the doctor and they say, oh, you have the flu, but you also have the secondary infection of strep. Well, that's what we're talking about when they're giving you the antibiotics. It's to treat the strep, not the flu. Immunizations are going to be the most effective way of helping prevent viral infections. We have a lot of immunizations out there that we have solid evidence that work very well, like measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, you don't hear about a lot of these unless you're going to hear about them in areas where people are unvaccinated. Another one is smallpox. The last natural case of smallpox happened in the 19, I believe, 70s. And so we have not seen smallpox, and it's due to that vaccination process. Other times vaccinations have to be done more often, and this is like what you see with the flu. They have to kind of guess what they think is going to be the main issue in that flu season. They package that shot, and it has to be taken each year, and sometimes they're right in their guess of which flus are going to be the worst, and sometimes they're not. Now, another issue with viruses is some of them can be what we call latent viruses, meaning they can lay dormant for a really long time. They can hide themselves away in your cells, and then they can start to replicate when conditions are good or when they're triggered. This means that symptoms can be caused a lot of times because of stress. We see this with cold sores. Herpes viruses are notorious for this. They like to lay dormant, and when your body is stressed or when your body is weak due to like another illness, they come into play. They cause and they reemerge. Okay, when we talk about, like we said, when we talk about herpes, we talk about the cold sores or even shingles because that's a chickenpox virus that reemerges okay after your body has been stressed or something like that so those are some examples of those latent viruses all right this brings us to fungi fungi is going to be microscopic but it's kind of plant-like in its structure. Um, it is larger than bacteria. There's only a few type of fungus that are pathogenic, so we don't hear about it near as often. And a lot of times the fungal infections that we do see are more superficial. We're gonna see them more on the skin. If they get deeper into the body, this does create a big problem because fungal infections are super hard to treat when they're deep-seated. And a lot of times we're just trying to keep them from taking over. All right, so when we look at this, there's kind of two main types. We have the tinea, and this is where you see more on the skin. Okay, so the tinea would be things like athlete's foot, cradle cap, ringworm. Those are all examples of a type of superficial skin infection. On the other hand, you have the canididia. The canididia is also superficial on the skin, but also the mucous membranes. And so we see that if this gets, this is kind of also known as a yeast infection. We see that that can happen in the vagina. We call that vaginitis or a yeast infection. We also see that if this particular type of fungus gains access into the mouth, it causes lots of sores in there, and that's called thrush. Now, guys, thrush you see a lot in kids because kids put stuff in their mouth, okay? They regularly put things in their mouth. On the other hand, we also see it very common in the immunocompromised, like HIV or AIDS patients. And this is because their immune system just has a hard time fighting it. We sometimes see that fungal infections might be treated with antibiotics, but a lot of times we're going to see that they're going to use antifungal medications. It's often difficult to cure and get rid of a fungal f infection altogether, so long-term types of therapy may be needed, especially when we're talking about those deep-seated infections that might occur. The next one is the rickettsia. The rickettsia is also a microscopic organism um, that is an intermediate between bacteria and viruses. This one must live in a host cell as well. So it has to gain access into your cells just like a virus does. 
These guys though are spread a lot of times by what we call a vector. Vectors are types of arthropods normally. Sometimes they can be birds or things like that. But these guys are carried by arthropods that are transmitted when they bite you. And this includes fleas, ticks, mites, and lice. One of the most common ones of this is called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This one does cause a very big rash on the body. It also causes you to have high fevers, but it can progress and become life-threatening very quickly if it's left untreated. The next groups are the protozoas. These are single-celled microscopic organisms. They are found in a lot of different areas, including like soil or water, things like that, but they like to live more on dead or decaying type of material. So most of the time, these guys are gonna help with the decomposition. We do see that we can get an infection with these through an infected insect, or we can end up unintentionally ingesting the spores of these guys. When we talk about malaria, malaria is the most common, and malaria is caused by a plasmodome that is transmitted by mosquitoes. So the mosquito bites somebody who has malaria, the plasmodome gets pulled up into the intestines of the mosquito. When the mosquito bites the next individual, it's going to then transmit the plasmodome into their blood. So then that's how it is transmitted from one person to the next is through mosquitoes. On the other hand, giardiasis is gonna become from infected water. This is gonna be contaminated water that you end up drinking, and a lot of times this is transmitted through birds. And so like with bird droppings, they might contaminate the water, adding this to it, which then if you were to drink it, it then causes severe abdominal pain, cramping. A lot of times it looks very similar to a type of like food poisoning in that sense, um, but treatment needs to be potentially given because if it does migrate out of the intestinal tract, it can migrate into the brain and cause more issues. That is very rare, but it is a potential complication that can occur. The last group that we see infection-wise are the helminths. These are the worms. We have the roundworms. They're in the group called nematoda. And we have the flatworms, which are the platyminthes. Now, pinworms and tapeworms are actually the most common. Pinworms are found a lot of times in kids, and this is due to not wiping properly, and it causes anal itching, okay? They'll get to be these small little worms that are around the anus, and the main symptom they have is that when the child's not very active, they're sitting or sleeping, they become, these guys become more active and they cause itching in the anus. It's something that a lot of kids, even in the United States, have and deal with, but it's not life-threatening. On the other hand, we have tapeworms. These can cause intestinal disease. This is due to the fact that they grow and they will actually eat off of what you eat, all right? And this is gonna come mostly by eating meat that was undercooked. And so this is why a lot of times there's a disclaimer when you go into a restaurant about how consuming undercooked meat could cause illness. This is what they're talking about, all right? So we see that some things, especially like pork or beef, this can be a problem. All right, tapeworms are gonna be one of those things that you have to make sure you remove in their entirety. If you leave a piece of them, they'll grow into a whole new tapeworm. So flatworms kind of have that ability. We also see some other types of flatworms or helmet types of infections like roundworms. Uh, flukes are a flatworm infection. They a lot of times get their name based on where they like to invade or reside. So like lung flukes, bladder flukes, blood flukes, liver flukes, that kind of thing. We also see a roundworm, a nematode that can cause major issues, not here in the United States, but a lot of times in areas where water is, is contaminated a lot are going to be Ascarius. It's a type of roundworm um, that can invade the intestines and it takes over. Um, and a lot of times it causes a lot of bloating to take place. And those worms will just reproduce like crazy within the individual's intestines. So these are worm type infections. Now, no matter what infection we're looking at, a lot of times we're gonna see certain symptoms that come into play, things like fever, uh, tachycardia, which is increased heart rate, uh, malaise, and malaise, guys, is just where you feel kind of icky or bleh, okay? It's a feeling that you just feel bad, okay? Um, we also see leukocytosis can be seen in blood work. This is gonna be an increased level of white blood cells that are present. And then also if the blood starts to get infected with the pathogen or a toxin, we can see that septicemia takes place. All right, so if the blood becomes infected with the pathogen or a toxin from the pathogen, it's called septicemia. All right, the last thing we wanna talk about is how do we test for infections and what type of infection, because this is gonna help lead us to what kind of treatment. 
all right because if it's not a bacterial infection we don't want to necessarily subscribe prescribe antibiotics all right but if it's not a fungal infection we don't want to give antifungals so we want to make sure we know what we're dealing with before we potentially give these treatments so there's a number of things we can end up taking some blood in the blood we can look at a number of stuff like uh, white blood cell count certain white blood cells are high during certain types of infections that could help lead us to the potential culprit we also could take a a culture of the area this is where they swab the area or even take a little piece of what's causing the problem and they culture it out if it grows on a plate like you see here in the red that's going to show you that bacteria is present all right so bacteria can grow on these culture plates we also can grow fungus on plates but they're going to look a lot different and you have to have different conditions for them to grow when we have things that can grow on plates like the culture plates we can do sensitivity testing that's what you see in these two other pictures in the green and kind of purple picture this is where they've taken discs or strips that have different amounts of medication or even different medications like antibiotics on them and they're going to see which ones work best against that particular bacteria this helps us pinpoint and use the antibiotics that are going to be effective we also can do antigen antibody tests. This is where they go and do that, that test, like when you go in to get tested for the flu or strep throat or even COVID, where they're gonna take the swab, they put some chemicals on it, and if a color change happens, that tells us that the antibodies antigen is, is present. And so because of that, then you are positive for that particular illness. So there are some things we can do there. Another one is a skin test. You can see that here. We do this for TB, for tuberculosis. What they're going to do is they inject um, dead kind of shells of the bacteria and they wait to see if your immune system has a response. Now this type of test is a delayed response. So they'll have to inject you and then you have to come back two days later, maybe three days later. Normally it's two, I believe. And they're going to look at it. And if you have a reaction like we see here, in this case, you're positive for it, which means you've either had TB before or you currently have tuberculosis. This leads them to do a next test where they're going to do a chest x-ray because some people also give a false positive on this test. All right, but this is one of the things that we would look at specifically for tuberculosis. So these are just some examples. We're looking at ways to test for infection, but this kind of is a brief kind of quick overview of infection and inflammation. And if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. I'm here to help. Thank you.